Hello, everyone. This is Mike Murphy, Director of Fix Us. Thanks so much for joining the call today. It's great to have so many people on from all over the country uh, for this conversation. You know, as regulars to the Fix Us events and calls will know, now this call is just part of our varied efforts to convene and connect uh, different perspectives regarding the nature of polarization, distrust, uh, dysfunction in our democracy, and, uh, and various ideas people are putting for forward uh, for what can be done about it. And our, um, our conversation and guest today, uh, I'm excited to, to talk about, is the focus on the challenges to our democracy posed by uh, mis and disinformation and the negative impacts therein on our society, which has been a growing topic of study uh, in recent years. We're going to focus on this today by hearing about a recent report that was released on this topic uh, that we thought might be a good way to spur discussion of the issue amongst you all. Uh, to talk about this topic, I'm really pleased uh, to have with us on the call today is Ryan Merkley. Now, Ryan is the Managing Director of Aspen Digital, which is a project at the Aspen Institute, which describes itself as having the purpose of empowering policymakers, civic organizations, companies, and the public to be responsible stewards of technology and media in the service of an informed, just, and equitable world. He's also the director of the Commission on Information Disorder at the Aspen Institute, which released a report late last year and which he's going to talk to us about today. Now, Ryan, prior to joining Aspen, was most recently chief of staff at the Wikimedia Foundation. He's got a very impressive background of other positions related to the issues we're going to talk about today. I encourage you all to check out his bio. We sent a link in advance. And um, before I hand it to Ryan uh, to talk about the topic of the day, uh, just a few housekeeping items we are recording this session so we can share it uh, with those in our network. And in addition to hearing from Ryan, we're going to get to comments and questions from you. We're hoping to field uh, several questions from you during the conversation. Ryan's going to speak about the work of the commission he directs and its report uh, for about 10 to 15 minutes max. But then we're going to open it up for questions. So at any time, starting when Ryan's speaking, you can start to get in the queue. Uh, we'll get to as many as we can. You can press 1 uh, at any time to get into the queue. Again, just press 1, and we'll get folks uh, in to, to ask, some, ask some questions to Ryan. So uh, with that, again, really excited to have Ryan with us. And Ryan, I'm going to hand it over to you. Well, good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you're dialing in from. Uh, my name's Ryan, and uh, thanks so much for that warm introduction. Uh, it's a real pleasure to have a conversation uh, with all of you today. Um, you know, the, the work uh, that Fix Us does is so very much in line with the recommendations uh, and, the is and the sort of assessment of the issues around polarization and the, and the, the loss of trust or the need to build new trust. Uh, that sits at the foundations of those. Uh, so I'm excited to have this conversation today. Um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about uh, the Aspen Institute's Commission on Information Disorder, uh, which uh, I, uh, I helped to direct um, as we put out our report uh, last uh, October. Um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the the principles that underpin that uh, work, which I think are important and relate so directly to the work uh, you all do and care about, um, and also some of the recommendations. Uh, and I hope that we can talk about uh, your questions. And also, um, I would love to get your ideas or thoughts about how we can bring some of these recommendations to reality and to life, which is really the next and most important phase of work. Let me start my timer so that I don't run over time. Um, so the commission uh, was a a six-month commission, started its work uh, April 15th of 2021, had three co-chairs, uh, Katie Couric, uh, the journalist Rashad Robinson, uh, who is an activist uh, working uh, around issues of race uh, and equity, uh, and Chris Krebs, uh, the former uh, head of CISA, uh, who were responsible, amongst other things, for election security uh, in the most recent election, uh, and was perhaps quite famously fired by tweet by Donald Trump after he declared the 2020 election uh, to be uh, the most secure in American history. There were 13 other commissioners uh, whose experiences range uh, sort of across the spectrum. And I think it would be fair to say, for those who've looked at the list, um, that this is not the typical group of folks you might have assembled if you said, find me the people who work uh, on disinformation today. 
there were some of those folks there, uh, for sure, uh, in that room, some really, really bright folks who think all day about issues of disinformation uh, from the Stanford Internet Observatory, people who've written books about algorithms and bias, um, and people who study uh, issues around disinformation around topics like the election. But there are also folks in adjacent fields, uh, people interested in the decline of journalism, which so relates to trust, people interested in issues of race, people uh, issue, interested uh, in issues around empathy and how humans connect with each other, which is, again, fundamental to how we connect. And so you got a bit of a different view. And I, I think in the, in the end, that made the commissions work better uh, and gave it uh, a higher level view of the problem. And you'll see that in the recommendations. Uh, the commission spent the first half of its work setting its priorities and doing research. Um, we did academic reviews uh, of existing work. We brought in expert briefers. There's a series called Disinfo Discussions that we produced where we brought in folks to talk to us. We recorded those and published them all as podcasts and video if you're interested in any of those topics. Everything from cognitive science to Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act. Um, we really took a broad view. Um, and we brought technical advisors in uh, to ask us some key questions, including some folks from the platform, so we could kind of put them on the spot and try to understand some of the uh, issues that uh, they have raised and also some of their failures. Um, the first phase of work, as I said, set out a, the priorities, and I'll talk about those in a second. And the second phase uh, produced a set of insights and recommendations, and there are 15 recommendations in these three priority categories. The eight key insights are important because they explain how the commission attacked the problem. And I think when you hear these uh, eight insights, and I'll go through them quickly, um, you'll see how much alignment there is with the way you all approach these, these issues. The first um, insight is that disinformation is a symptom of a larger set of problems, that the disease is actually complex structural inequities, that there are fundamental issues and cracks in our society across the spectrum that create the space for distrust and or the, la the absence of trust altogether that prevents us from coming together and having meaningful discourse or creates opportunities for those who want to create discord to do so. Uh, and so it's the crack that the wedge gets drive, driven into and, and disinformation is the wedge in that, in that story. The takeaway from that for the commission is if you don't talk about or address those issues, you never get to meaningful discourse. And I'm sure all of this sounds familiar to all of you. I know that's a key insight of your work as well. Second uh, insight was that absence of clear leadership is slowing responses. There are it seems that every single week there is another uh, another organization or another uh, legislator putting forward a bill to address these issues, but it's never been completely clear who's running the show on some of these issues. And, and particularly in the administration, it hasn't been clear um, where responsibility lies and, and what part of it is the administration's responsibility. There are parts of this that are not, that those things rightly belong with civil society or with the media to hold itself accountable for publishing facts or not publishing facts, um, or for each of us as consumers. Uh, and, and there are roles for each of us in that. And it's been unclear where the, uh, where the administration fits in that and what it's going to or not going to do. Third is the trade-offs between speech and misinformation are not easy. Uh, the First Amendment is fundamental uh, to American democracy, and uh, it will be difficult to address issues of what some call bad speech without um, uh, compromising the First Amendment. And the commission felt really strongly that that was an important and fundamental value that it didn't want to betray. And so the recommendations, as you'll see, don't step over that line uh, of, of, you know, asking the government to regulate speech. Um, and that obviously there are some folks who feel differently about that, but it's a fundamental value that the commission held on to and, and underpin. And we actually had um, at least one uh, sort of First Amendment expert uh, as one of the commissioners, Jamil Jaffer from the Knight First Amendment Center, who was really invaluable to those conversations. Fourth, disinformation doesn't just deceive, it, it gives permission, which is just to say that disinformation isn't just a supply problem. It's not just about those who make it. It's a demand problem. There are people who want to hear that disinformation. It validates beliefs they already have or suspicions they've already had, even when it's being validated with false information. We have to address that. 
Um, it can't just we can't just blame this on the massive amplification role that the platforms play. We have to start talking also about the demand for this content that uh, many users uh, are seeking it uh, and finding uh, forming groups around it. So there's a supply problem and also a demand problem. Fifth is the platforms have uh, lack of transparency and they have been hampering solutions. Uh, and I think we all know this and anybody who read the Wall Street Journal series on Facebook um, you know, shows that not only have the platforms um, been uh, failed to be transparent, but in some cases have actually obfuscated or even lied about what they knew or didn't know, uh, what they did or didn't do. Uh, and so we, we can't make good public policy and we can't understand what's happening to us as a society or as individuals if we can't understand what's happening on the platforms uh, and what they're doing and what choices they're making in the product that may be impacting how we behave or how we perceive what we uh, are reading or seeing. Six is that online incentives drive ad revenue, not better public discourse. So it's the business model. Um, and as long as that is the business model uh, at the platform level, it will always make choices that optimize for the business model. But we're not in the business of optimizing for the business model. We, uh, as civil society, are in the business of trying to have healthy public discourse that allows people who reasonably disagree to come to consensus or at least to conclusion where they can move forward. Um, and there is an obvious conflict there uh, that needs to be addressed in some meaningful way. And it may affect the business models of those platforms. The right outcomes may have an impact on their ability to do that. And for the good of society, that may have to happen. Seventh is that broken norms are allowing bad actors to flourish, and I'll talk about that in the recommendations. But essentially, we all have a responsibility to decide what we as the society are willing to accept or not accept. Um, will we accept a politician who lies? Will we accept a press who repeats it? Um, will we accept companies who uh, take those positions and defend bad actors, uh, whether they're on their platforms or whether it's just where they put their advertising? We get to vote with our dollars. That's how capitalism works, and that's uh, fundamental to consumers' rights, and they can make choices about what they were willing to accept in that culture. Uh, those are norms, and those norms have shifted over time, and so there's a space to talk about how to shift those norms in a direction we want uh, as a society for better outcomes. And then the last one, which I talked off right, right off the top, is that local media um, has really withered. Um, Margaret Sullivan at the New York Times uh, talked about this to the commission and quoted a fact that was utterly staggering, that 2,300 news outlets have gone under um, in the U.S. These are local news outlets that would have been serving your local community at whatever level, telling stories of, uh, you know, uh, happening in your community from your own perspective. And the loss of that has led also to a loss of trust. Um, it's also an editorial loss of what gets covered and the way that it gets covered. Uh, and that's meant a meaningful impact on, on trust in general. So let me talk about the recommendations and I'll keep it at a high level so that um, we have an opportunity to talk together. And if there's one that I reference that you'd like more detail on, um, you're welcome, of course, to read the report, but I'm also happy to take a more detailed question uh, and, and we can dig into that together. As I said off the top, there are three priorities that the commission identified. The first is increasing transparency and understanding. This is about enhancing access um, into the social media platforms, practices, how they do moderation, um, what their, how their platforms work, but also a deeper examination of the information environment and how it is interdependent. We need to understand how these things work so that we can make good policy and so that people can make good choices uh, about what they're going to believe or not believe. Second is building trust. Um, this is an exploration of the challenges that we face building and rebuilding trust in the institutions that people look to or count on to make informed decisions for themselves or in their families or to inform public discourse and debate and the role that reliable facts and content play in those conversations. And the third category is about reducing harms. Um, this is about interventions that will reduce the worst harms of mis and disinformation like threats to public health, democratic participation, and the targeting of communities through hate speech or extremism. So I'll, I'll talk briefly about the recommendations in those three categories and wrap up in about five minutes. So the first group is transparency. And there are a number of recommendations, and I would say the majority of these recommendations focus on the platforms. Um, and they focus on legislative action or congressional action in order to compel them uh, to be more transparent. 
Um, the first is around researchers creating spaces to ensure that researchers have access to how the platforms work in ways that protect the privacy of users but uh, and don't damage the platforms, but ensure that they can do their work and we can have independent, verifiable research that lets us understand what's happening on the platforms. That relates to both what we call public data, which is data that is accessible to anyone, but is often scraped by uh, technical means that are sometimes deemed as a violation of terms of service, and also private data, where authorized researchers could be given access to do deeper research and understand how the platforms are working. Next in this group is high re a set of disclosures. Um, so one around high reach content. So getting access to what is the highest reach content on the platform, who's seeing it, and how is it potentially being targeted? So we can end the sort of anecdotal debates about who is favored and who is not on the platform and actually see the facts. Second is content moderation, also disclosure. What are the policies that the platforms are using? And most importantly, how are they implementing them or how are they failing to implement them? We heard in the Facebook files how the uh, blue check mark or the verified uh, status of a user gave them essentially permission to break those rules. Uh, and so there are policies, but they're not fol followed consistency, consistently, excuse me, and that makes it harder for us to know what's happening and also to hold platforms accountable and also to know whether their policies work or not. If they don't apply them, it's hard to know if they're working. And then the last disclosure in this group is ad transparency. Um, one of the large components here is around amplification and targeting uh, that is done with content. Um, and so we want not just to know about political ads, but actually all ads um, that are being targeted to know what, is, what ads are being placed, uh, in what format, um, and where. Uh, so we can answer that question of who's seeing what when. The second category is around trust, and there are a set of recommendations which take a much more systemic societal view of the problem. And this builds on that early insight that disinformation doesn't exist on its own, it's part of a larger component of society. The first recommendation is called Truth and Transformation, um, and it, it, built, it uh, points at a set of established models for truth and reconciliation conversations where you bring folks who disagree with each other or where there have been historical power imbalances and create spaces for them to talk to each other and have meaningful reconciliation of what has happened over time, the inequities that have existed, and to come to a better place. This is slow, community-led work. It takes time. It has to involve everyone. This isn't about blaming. This is about coming to an agreement of facts and coming to resolution as communities. Um, but it's fundamental to some of the really important breakdowns that exist in society today. And it's a proven model that's been done in over 50 countries around the world, including right here in the U.S. at local levels. Next is around healthy digital discourse. It's about looking at platforms that don't have ad revenue as their primary purpose, but actually have good discourse as their primary purpose, and looking for ways to build technological tools that make that more likely and more possible so we can talk together better online. Next is workforce diversity. This is looking for ways to address this inequity issue that is addressed earlier um, by looking at leadership in both the newsroom and tech companies. And the conclusion here is that um, good Good leadership will lead to better policies that don't promote inequities, both in product and in policy. Uh, I talked about local media investment, which is a really key piece here. So this is about rebuilding the fundamentals of knowledge and information in America. This is about how we get good local news, and part of how you do that is invest in local media. And then the last in this group is accountability norms. And I already talked about this one, and so I'll move past it. But I think we're looking at things like professional standard bodies, uh, medical associations, legal associations, holding members accountable when they share false health information uh, with the public for profit, or asking journalists to look differently about how they cover public officials when those officials are verifiably lying. Uh, in the past, they have just repeated this, this person said this fact and repeated the fact, but we now know that just doing that spreads the lie and causes people to believe it over time by repetition. So maybe we need new models of journalistic norms to ensure that they cover the story, but don't repeat known falsehoods. Uh, and the last one, sorry, there was one more in this, is which is around election information security. Uh, and this is about uh, really strengthening uh, U.S. election processes and, and communications so that the public knows how the election works 
and is more resilient to the kind of attacks that we've seen that have tried to undermine belief in the election process. Uh, everything from how voting systems uh, work to post-election audits. The last group is around harms. And I'm sorry, I'm a bit over time. I'll, I'll go a bit quickly here. Um, the first is a comprehensive federal approach. Right at the top, I talked about leadership. This responds to that and would ask the administration to have a comprehensive strategic approach to disinformation. Who's in charge, on what parts, and what is it doing, and when, and who? Next is a public restoration fund. This is a fund that is meant to develop misinformation countermeasures through education, research, and investment. This builds on a model that was used uh, um, with a, a campaign called the Truth Campaign, which put billions of dollars behind research and campaigns to stop teenagers from uh, using tobacco. It was a really successful program and it shows that an independent nonprofit that focuses on research and campaigns that help the public can meaningfully impact their behavior. So that's the idea there. Next is civic empowerment. This one looks at um, establishing ways to help users uh, see misinformation online and respond to it more effectively. Two more in this group. One is super spreader accountability. This would be asking for a set of transparent, clear, and consistently applied policies that target those uh, users who spread the most disinformation. Um, we often know who these folks are. There's a sort of often talked about statistic that the super spreaders of vaccine misinformation, there are only 12 of them, and that you can trace most vaccine disinfo back to those folks. Well, how do we hold those folks accountable and have a set of publicly available transparent rules that are applied to them that the platforms uh, draft, publish, and enforce? And then the last uh, is a set of recommendations around Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act. And the two pieces here that the Commission focused in on, one was um, paid advertising, and so uh, not focusing on stopping speech altogether, but addressing what does it mean when that speech is paid to be amplified, uh, and whether the platform should still have immunity for that content, or whether they should hold that kind of content to a higher standard. And the second is around uh, product features, uh, like algorithms and recommendation engines, um, which we know uh, have been shown to provide, uh, you know, kind of send people down the rabbit hole of disinformation, and that there should be an accountability for that. I'm going to stop there a couple minutes over time, um, but that's taken us through the 15 recommendations and the eight insights. And as I said off the top, you know, the real question that we want to ask is, what can we do? Um, what can organizations like Fix Us do? What can you as everyday citizens do? Um, and, and how can we work together on that? So I'm, I'm excited for your questions and, and thanks for listening. Ryan, thank you. That was great. Uh, great overview. Uh, we're going to get some folks in the queue um, to ask questions again. Folks, press 1 uh, if you want to get in the queue uh, to ask Ryan a question. Uh, again, press 1. And while folks are getting um, while folks are getting queued up, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take the liberty of throwing the first question myself. Uh, Ryan, all right, so when I'm looking at a lot of the different recommendations, there's so many different recommendations uh, that you guys put forward. I want to hone in on one. I'm curious if you could just elaborate on it a little bit. Um, it has to do, it's within the, you know, trust section, so the second section of recommendations. And it, and it has to do with the one about, you know, I read it as that there's, there's the need to develop and scale tools, networks, platforms that are actually designed to bridge divides, right? Like, I mean, the, the idea here that I've been thinking about is like so much obviously people are feeling like technology, social media, Etc. are just exacerbating <laughs> our divides right now. And what I what I found intriguing about the the prospect of this recommendation was how do you get some of these tools and technology working for you, right? Uh, at scale, yeah. kind of trying to divide, build empathy, strengthen trust amongst communities, as you said in the recommendation. Can you elaborate on that one? I'm curious if you can get a little granular there of like the types of things you're talking about. Um, what types of things are out there that kind of exist that could be amplified there? Uh, yeah, that's great. And, and, you know, that recommendation, um, so the, you know, there are uh, 16 commissioners and each of them had different levels of interest and expertise. And so it won't surprise you when I tell you that they sort of broke up into working groups and worked on different pieces of them. This particular one um, had some really excellent leadership from Deb Roy, who is a, uh, amongst other things, has led the MIT Media Lab um, and is working on some of these kinds of initiatives. And so they're looking at, you're, you've described it exactly correctly. So, you know, um, platforms and 
processes or tools inside platforms. Imagine, say, the comment section inside a newspaper um, that are designed to make for healthier discourse. Right now, the uh, what we're seeing is that in the platforms, um, you know, a lot of the the algorithms focus on engagement or other uh, kinds of um, uh, kinds of metrics that advantage outrage essentially um, and so they don't drive us to be uh, to have better discourse they drive us to see more of what elicits emotion uh, and sometimes those strong the strongest emotions are, are anger or frustration or rage and so you you have a tendency to see more um, and also a lot of those platforms um, fail in areas around trolling or harassment um, which drives um, folks off the platform altogether and so the idea here is to look at other other models that can can approach this. There's several cited in the report, um, Polis, Local Voices Network, Front Porch Forum. Um, all of these are, are platforms that are trying to take different uh, approaches. So Local Voices Network uses facilitation uh, in the dialogue in order to try and uh, you know keep engage people to having better conversations. Um, or uh, you know, Polis uses uh, algorithms to amplify opinions and connect people who are divided. And so it's, it's trying to kind of uh, intervene in the conversation in a helpful way that leads people back to good discourse instead of just amplifying loud, angry voices or when people, you know, um, basically less pitchforks and, and, and more collaboration is really what we're trying for. And I think the hope here is not just that you're going to build something that will uh, you know, replace Facebook or something like that. I think what the the larger hope here and the commission singled this out is that maybe we'll learn something from these platforms that can become a standard practice that is used everywhere. Um, and uh, we can we can see some of those tools be implemented in ways that we can find all over the place and including maybe even in platforms people already use like Facebook where they would get better. I mean, it, it's possible that they'll just go away. I mean, uh, just yesterday uh, was the first time ever that Facebook has showed less users quarter over quarter than the quarter before. So they've, they've seen a decline in growth. Um, you know, maybe that's the beginning of the long end, but they went from 1.93 billion users to 1.92 billion users. So probably Facebook's around for a while. Um, it would be nice if they were better. Um, at discourse. Uh, and so if there's not just these tools, but also if the big tools can adopt best practices that we learn from this, that would be good too. Great. Uh, thanks, Ryan. Right, I'm going to go to a couple of questions in the queue. Let's see. Um, okay. I think we got Barbara. Um, is it Barbara Lehmans, I believe is how you pronounce it. Um, Colin is helping me moderate this call. So Colin, can we get Barbara in the queue? And let's see if Barbara is there. Barbara, are you there? Okay, maybe we don't have Barbara. How about Julian Blair? Colin, let's go to Julian if he's... Um, I'm Julian here. Blair? Yeah, yeah, can go you ahead. hear me? Gotcha. Yeah, you hear me? Please. Huh? Can you hear me? Yeah. Hello. My question yes. has to do, do with censorship. Uh, we have several friends who are very anti-vax, and they complain that their sources on various platforms are being censored. So, is is what, how do you feel about platforms censoring? Uh, uh, websites that are actually for, um, spreading lies, really, about the vaccines and whatnot. How, how do you, how did your commission deal with that? Yeah, I think the the commission, uh, as I said off the top, took a um, took a view that you know the First Amendment is is important and fundamental, and so looked for ways to intervene that protected speech. Um, but also tried to balance the issue that there are real harms uh, that can happen to people. Uh, people can die uh, if they accept false information and make health choices that lead them to take uh, a risky treatment or to avoid something that might help them. And, and you know, vaccines have been shown uh, that they can 
save lives. Uh, and, and so I think there are real challenges here uh, about uh, allowing people to spread verifiably false information that can put others at risk. Uh, and so I think, you know, the, at the platform level, the platforms have uh, the tools available to them, uh, both technically and in law, to intervene to ensure that they take down bad content. Uh, I think they they are trying to err on the right side uh, or to be on the right side of history on those issues. I think we all know they've made mistakes, um, but I think on issues that affect public health um, and the safety of individuals, I think there's a real need to act to ensure that we are not spreading uh, information that can lead to people's um, you know to long-term health challenges or worse death. Um, and so I, I, I know it's frustrating for folks, but I, I do really think that, you know, we're seeing the worst version of some of these issues where people are literally dying because of the things that they have been led to believe, um, often by folks who are profiting from that, uh, who are selling them false cures. Um, and and I, I think we, we, have, we owe the public uh, to give them the best opportunity to make good choices for their family. I think that's what people want. And so I, I get that it's, it's hard, but I, I, I think in these cases where people are at risk, um, that, that there's a need to act. And I, I think that's how the commission felt. That's why in their recommendations, they talked about the worst actors and the greatest harms. And that, um, before I close out on this, I think they really wanted to acknowledge that um, we're not going to eradicate every falsehood from the internet. Uh, and that shouldn't be the point, because if you did that, you would turn the screws down so hard that you would really harm all kinds of good speech. You'd you'd harm legitimate dissent and important public discourse. And people should be able to disagree and question. That's normal. But when people spread things that are verifiably false, and they do so sometimes for their own benefit, but to the harm of others, there needs to be a way to intervene in order to protect the public more broadly. And thanks for the question. Yeah, thank uh, we're going to go to Francis. Um, Francis Johnson next. Uh, can we get Francis on tone and Francis, let us know when you're on there. Francis, are you on? Okay, Francis, are you there? Going once. <laughs> uh, okay, Colin, let's go to Rick. Uh, Rick Abaria, if we can get Rick on there. Might take a second. Hey, here. Mike. Hello. Hi, can you hear me? Yep. Yep, got you, Rick. Go okay. ahead. Okay. Right, so my question is, I, I'm wondering how the study has been received by groups, depending on whether the groups are more to the right or more to the left. I know Fix Us, we're nonpartisan, uh, but I, know if, I don't know if you presented it or if you shared it with groups from one of the two, not extremes, at least the right or left, and has it been received differently by either one and how? Mm. Um, so we've, we've shared it quite broadly, and I think, you know, when I look at the criticisms that we've seen, um, I've actually been quite heartened by the way people have engaged with the content itself, and so most of the comments have been about... Um, would this work or would this not work? Really not as much partisan uh, partisanship that I think perhaps we were anticipating. Certainly when the commission was announced, there was a lot, uh, especially from the far right, uh, mostly targeting, you know, sort of past behavior of commissioners uh, or, or their sort of political leanings. Um, but none of that was actually about what the commission did or, or had done. It was about what those folks had done before. Um, and so, no, I, I haven't seen an extreme partisan response in either end. Frankly, I was I was prepared for both the right to say that the commission was uh, had gone too far, and for the left to say the commission had not gone far enough. Um, and and perhaps those those things may happen. But I, I think what we have seen is a, a real desire to engage on this issue. I mean, the 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 topic really shifted quite dramatically in the last. Uh, in in the months where we were releasing the report, you had the Facebook files come out. You had hearing after hearing on the Hill. And one of the things you saw, while I would say the left and the right don't agree on what they would like to do, there was an, a more alignment that something needed to be done than I had seen in some time. And so uh, 
I don't think we've come to consensus on what should be done yet by any stretch, but I haven't seen the kind of polarized rancor on this report. Um, I feel like we've been fortunate in that. I, it doesn't mean it's not coming, uh, but we haven't seen it yet. Thanks, Rick, for the question. We're going to go to Mike Herbert next. Mike Herbert, Mike, are you there? Let's get Mike on. Hey, hey, how you doing? Good, Mike. Go ahead. Um, thanks for your time. I, I think, uh, I, you know, I've always thought whether it's a fact checker, you know, how it's verified or approved, and there's Snopes and PolitiFacts and all these things. I, I mean, it, not necessarily social media, but I guess even, you know, how it comes to debates or people in traditional media as a way of not limiting free speech and letting people sort of say what they want. Is there, has there ever been any talk about, you know, someone that's, I don't know, that's from the government or from some hybrid of social media type, uh, type thought processes, but where it's sort of, you know, we could get, you know, hey, this person, you know, in fairly real time is saying things that are unverified or untrue or proven to be untrue. Is that a little kind of too radical? Um, yeah, I, I don't I don't think it's too radical at all, Mike. And, and thanks for the question. Um, there's lots of folks trying to do research in this place and in, in this space around interventions that um, kind of wrap around speech rather than uh, restricting speech. Um, Brendan Nyan is a researcher who we spoke to as part of the commission and studies cognitive science. He's became quite famous for both inventing what's called the backfire effect, uh, which says that depending on who fact checks a thing, you become more entrenched in your belief if you don't like the person who fact checked it. And he was also famous as being the person who debunked the backfire effect and proved that that's not true um, and that uh, fact checks actually don't land particularly differently based on who the fact checker is, or if you like or align politically with the fact checker. Um, one of the things we know is that the fact checks um, uh, don't don't stick, um, and so they can they can help in the moment, but they don't stick as long as perhaps we'd like. So it doesn't immediately reverse your position forever, but it may kind of slow you uh, in in your approach. There's lots of folks who are working on these interventions, though. And so if you think about if you're a Twitter user, um, if you try to share an article that you see on Twitter and you haven't clicked the link to read the article yet, Twitter will ask you, would you like to read the article? Product designers call that adding friction to the product. And one of the things that they found is it causes people, uh, it not perhaps not surprisingly, uh, people tend to not always share then. They say, oh, you're right, I haven't read it. And so maybe they don't share it. Um, or they go read it and maybe they still share it, but they share it diff with, in different contexts. And so no one has stopped you from sharing. They've just sort of said, do you want to think about that? And I think those kinds of interventions can be really interesting. Um, the other thing people are talking a lot about is what's called pre-bunking, which is really just saying, what are the things we know are coming? Uh, what are things we think people are going to say? For example, in the lead up to the 2020 election, it was pretty clear that there was a likelihood that some folks were going to say that the election results were not valid um, and that some of those criticisms were not based on fact. And so there were ways to uh, put, you know, put that in front of people and say, it's likely people are going to say this. Here are the facts about how voting machines work. And that has been shown to help people be more resilient to false uh, statements when they kind of already know what's coming. And so that's also an interesting thing that doesn't impinge on speech, still allows people to say uh, what they want, but equips the public to kind of see them coming when some of those allegations may not be based on fact. Thanks, Mike. For the question, I think we got time for maybe one, maybe two more. Uh, we fit it in. We're going to go to Cheryl Grave next. Uh, Colin, let's get Cheryl on. Cheryl, are you on there yet? Yeah. Hello. Can you hear me? Yep. Cheryl, got got you. Yeah. Great. Go ahead. Great. Thanks. Um, yeah. Hi. I wonder if you could say a little bit more about sort of the commission's conversation and how you envisioned everyday Americans building part of that. Uh, trust and, you know, sort of new norms 
and uh, holding elected leaders accountable for when they betray the public trust through mis and disinformation. Thanks for the question. This one's uh, one that's sort of near and dear to me because I think we we sometimes forget or are made to forget how how much power we have as individuals and as a collective uh, to make choices about what we care about uh, or what we're going to allow or accept. Um, and so, you know, the examples I gave include things like associations holding their members accountable or journalists uh, changing their norms of practice. But I think there's also a, a large piece around the public getting to make choices about who they want to do business with and how they want to uh, what they're willing to accept. So I'll, I'll, I'll rip something from the headlines and use it as an example. Um, a lot of talk these days about Spotify and uh, Joe Rogan and a number of folks who are angry about um, the way that he's uh, spoken about vaccine misinformation um, and that Spotify's pay, you know, he's essentially a, a part of, uh, he's published by Spotify. They paid him a hundred million dollars to be their broadcaster. Um, and so, You've got folks talking about, uh, you've got artists saying they're going to leave the platform. You've got folks like Neil Young, you've got Joni Mitchell, you've got Brene Brown, the podcaster, talking about, about it. But you've also got users saying, I'm not going to give you my money if this is what you're going to program. Um, and I think users have a lot of power to choose to buy things or not that they don't agree with. And so if you don't like the way Facebook works and you have the ability to not be on Facebook, which I recognize some people need it in, in, in part of how they, they engage with the world, they can make, consumers can make choices and those things over time can, can change. Uh, and so you could see, you know, if people move off of Spotify, it might cause them to think differently. Maybe it doesn't get rid of Joe Rogan, but maybe it changes their policy and you've already seen them come out and try to clarify. And so that's a way of the public setting an expectation about what they're okay with or not okay with. Um, and I think there are ways for the, the public to do that. I think similarly, there are ways to do that with politicians. I mean, it's harder these days because obviously the way, you know, the way politicians get elected, they're directly accountable to the public, but the way politicians get funded can be much more complex. Um, and so, um, those loyalties have always have been challenging for the public. Um, and so I'm not saying they're easy answers, but what I am saying is I don't want, uh, the public to forget that collectively the individuals actually have a lot of power when they work to choose to work together uh, to have influence over how people behave, especially those that either uh, rely on them as customers or those for whom they are their constituents. Uh, and there's, there's power there uh, that people can exercise. Um, that's really the, the idea behind all that. Great. Thank you, Cheryl. I think we're unfortunately running short on time, so I'm gonna I'm gonna wrap this up with one um, one last question from myself here uh, for you, Ryan, and then you can kind of add on to it with any sure concluding concluding comments you want to make. But the the basic one is the, the what do people do? Like, what, where do you go from here, and what do you um, what any ask would you make of anyone on this that is interested in um, learning more? finding out what you guys are up to and where they can, where they can plug in. So I'll leave it to you to close there. And again, Ryan, thanks for joining us. That's right. And, and thanks to everybody for the questions, uh, Julian, Rick, Mike, Cheryl, thank you. Appreciate those questions. Um, the, uh, what can you do? So um, there's a lot of recommendations and they're kind of all over the board here. And so there are ways that you can engage your elected representatives and say these issues are important. And if you agree with any of the suggestions there, I think it's great to tell them uh, as they're thinking this through. We're talking to uh, uh, congressional um, members about this and there's been a lot of interest. I think there's also lots of ways that uh, on if you're working on these issues that you can you can bring this stuff up um, and surface them. You can follow Aspen Digital um, and as we're continuing to do this work, we'd love to hear your thoughts and ideas and you're, they're always welcome. Um, so um, I, I think those are really the key things and, and also, you know, if you have something that you want to bring to our attention, we really welcome it. Um, you know, our our ideas were not meant to be the final ideas. They're meant to get people talking about the various ways we could tackle these problems. So I really appreciate your questions uh, and the chance to talk about it with you. So thanks for having me and, and I look forward to more. Perfect. Well, thank you so much again, Ryan. And, uh, and thanks to everybody for joining today. 
uh, look forward to having you on the next one and hope everyone has a nice uh, rest of your day. Take care, everybody. Thank you.